thanks very much. Excuse me a second while I just get my screens all sorted out. Um, uh, right, so I'm going to, uh, hopefully you can see that. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to just talk about some of the stuff that I've been up to uh, and what I learned from it. Um, uh, so if, uh, if you haven't seen it, basically I've got just a, a static HTML page or, or rather it updates when I update it um, that just looks at COVID-19 cases in England. Um, there's a bit of just exploration, description of what the data does. Um, and then it digs into particular areas where there have been restrictions, where there are current restrictions, and also tries to identify places uh, just from the data where probably we should be a bit worried and probably there should be restrictions or, or we could um, anticipate there might be upcoming restrictions. Um, and then also generate graphs and stuff for any areas of interest. So ones that are in the news and I just currently have a running thing on, on London because people are worried about London even. Um, well, there are lots of other places they should be more worried about. And the graphs themselves look something like this. Um, as Stuart said, using the, the colour scheme, I'll come on to that, that bit later, that gives it a nice sunset feel, uh, I, I think, over, over cliffs. Um, this, uh, this example also, just to demonstrate that it's got, um, it, it uh, highlights um, the times when there are lockdowns. And I use this example because it shows places going into lockdown, coming out of lockdown, going into lockdown again. Um, so with those kind of white, white areas to illustrate when those lockdowns happen and also this thing about how do we communicate with people that some of these numbers are, are underestimates so so i've got over on the on the right the kind of this this stuff is underestimates the stuff on the on the very right hand side is underestimates and we can't really tell how much and i'll come on to that in a bit so uh some lessons uh um numbering from zero because i'm a programmer and that gives me a maximum number of five uh you'll see later. Uh, so this is all done in R Markdown kind of for fun because um, uh, this is my first R Markdown stuff and I wanted to learn it and the best way of learning is by doing uh, and it's kind of neat and uh, so recommend it if you if you want to try out doing some doing some R. R Markdown basically inter interpolates the analyses that you do in the R uh, that you do uh, amongst your normal Markdown and generates HTML pages off the back of it. It's quite cool. Um, first thing I wanted to draw out was this thing about APIs versus static files. So the, the pages that I generate are based on the static file that is, is created every day that is a that contains all the data on cases in England at local authority level, but also at, at higher levels. Uh, so it also creates, uh, it contains nation level stuff. Um, and I'm using that rather than the APIs that are available, um, because you can get the whole thing in one lump. And that was what was available when I was uh, first doing it in July. Um, and I haven't had time to adapt to the APIs themselves. Um, but I also thought it was just interesting. This, that time series data at local authority level is an obvious thing that lots of people who are doing these visualizations might want to get hold of. Creating them as static files means that if there's a lot less load on the API, um, uh, which would alleviate some of the problems that Stuart was talking about, about it going down all the time. So complementing APIs with static files for, you know, standard downloads, I think is a, it would be a good idea. It's a good idea. Um, second thing to talk about, we've already touched on it, missing data. So um, when I first started, uh, so as I said, then I've got this kind of underestimates thing at the, at the end because the, um, we know that reporting delays mean that you don't get the, the right numbers of cases, the accurate numbers of cases for a few days. Um, um, oh, sorry, I was, yeah, for, the, and for the lockdown areas, um, then Sorry, that's the, that's the next point. The, the lockdown areas, I, there wasn't anything about where lockdowns were or when they came into place. So basically I created a, a Google spreadsheet that contained that information that was good enough for me and for my analysis. That basically it has like one row per um, announcement of a change in roughly, uh, of a change in lockdown state. Um, you can see during the early stages, there were lots of announcements on GovUK of 
uh, lockdowns that then only that then only came into legislation like six days later, for example. So this kind of data highlights how the government decision making about uh, lockdowns were communicated differently on GovUK to legislation.gov.uk and there's been lots of there's been lots of conversation recently on Twitter about how to get data about those local lockdowns and where they are and what's actually involved in local lockdowns and it's all a bit of a mess because it's not really um, structured as you, as uh, the, the lockdowns themselves aren't really structured right there isn't a formal way of, of describing those lockdowns there are various places where you can now go and get um, data about those lockdowns this is the summary of them from Matthew Somerville from Dakaros who, who has done an API that gives you at a postcode level what the lo lockdown looks like right now um, and gives kind of highlights of the, the good things and bad things about the, the different kinds of ones that are available. Um, I haven't looked into whether they do the kind of timeline version that, that I need for the visualizations I'm creating, but um, that for understanding lockdown rules now, then these are the places to go. Third thing was about uncertain data, which is that stuff about what happens at the end. So um, there, there is a period of time, but it, like basically July, where you can uh, get hold of data that um, easily ish for, from a on a day-to-day -day basis that can tell you that you can use in order to see what the reporting delays look like in normal circumstances and based on an analysis of that so i looked at how long it takes to to get to the the final value and you can see for example with blackburn on darwin on a one particular day then it takes about it took about six days for it to get to the final value um, the graph on the on the bottom right shows how that kind of changes over time basically on day zero or day one um, then everybody reports zero cases and they might end up having 80 um, but you can't tell what that's going to look like from that data so uh, using data from about five days ago is it gives you a, uh, um, a, a moderately solid estimate of what is what it's eventually going to turn out to actually be the the real figure uh, that was all before um, all of the stuff that hit the news recently about the lost test results, which of course also adjusts those figures um, and mean that the, the previous figures were over a, quite a long period of time, as Stuart highlighted, were, were wrong. Um, but we ought to also be treating any of these numbers with a pinch of salt, obviously, because it all depends, uh, case data all depends on the availability of testing and uh, two weeks ago or, or um, three weeks ago then that was the thing that everybody was worried about lack of testing and and uh, which would obviously then have an impact on the numbers um, I've got a bit of my uh, analysis that looks at that testing data and looks at whether in order to try and understand when we shouldn't be trusting those case numbers and um, you can see the top left there looks at it over the entire course of the of the epidemic and uh, the basically at the beginning of the epidemic then the the number of um, tests that were going on by case was such that you really couldn't trust that that data there was uh, about a third of the um, tests would turn into a case which means that you're not testing enough um, then it became fairly good and in particular a part of part of the reason that it looks like that is because we didn't have data actually about how much commercial testing was going on um, and so uh, since mid July, then that's looked better. So if you look on the top right, then that's the picture of the what's happened since July. And you can see recently then that again, that percentage has been creeping up, which implies that there aren't enough, um, that, that there's, uh, there's some strain on the testing capacity. And then the bottom, um, graph looks at testing capacity, reported testing capacity versus reported numbers of tests, um, which you can see hit a, a peak of uh, um, draw on capacity around mid-September of about 95%, but has dropped down since then. None of that is actually really helpful when you're looking at local authority level, though, because uh, testing capacity at different local authorities might be different. And so um, the it, it, I find it very hard to know how much to take that testing data and really apply it to, to how much to 
agree with or not agree with the, the kind of or, or put some fuzziness around the kind of case figures that were coming through. Um, but it's an interesting thing to look at. Um, fourth thing I want to talk about standards. So um, as I said, the, the colour scheme is um, one that I've adopted from elsewhere, specifically the uh, stuff that um, California came out with around identifying what kind of levels you need to be worried about. And that's what Stuart has, has also adopted. And we've been having some conversations now that the level is, is so much more than seven in lots of different places, what to now call these extra levels. And also, obviously, we have to decide what colour to use them as well. Um, uh, there is, uh, I saw going around today, this other stuff that was a proposal from um, Institute for Government, I think, around um, different ways in which you could label that. If you look at it, actually, that level four, 50 to 1000, is a huge span that is actually the same as widespread in our, uh, in the way in which we're classifying it. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't modify really the, the problem of having undifferentiated kind of um, things. But it's interesting to see this, kind of what's the, the emerging standardization of how we talk about these kinds of figures. And then the fifth point that I just wanted to make was around decision making. So um, part of the point with the analysis that I was doing was how can we help local authorities to understand what their what the picture looks like in their area? Um, how can we help their decisions decisions to be made about whether there should be some local lockdowns? Um, and currently, this is from today, so there are 204 areas in the UK, in the England rather, where there's widespread infection and 154 of them aren't in lockdown. Um, that number has been going up every single, every single day, including the ones that aren't currently in lockdown. And when you look at the graphs and look at the, the kind of um, prevalence of COVID-19 in these particular areas, it's very hard to see the rationale behind why some areas would be in lockdown and others aren't in lockdown. So on the right, Manchester has been in lockdown since the beginning of August. It went into lockdown when the level of infection was substantial um, and uh, cases have continued to rise. Um, but in Nottingham, then uh, despite being at that same see, being at the same level as Manchester was when it went into lockdown in early September, nothing's been done. There's no there's no um, there's no local lockdown in place, and so that kind of calls into question: What is it that the government is using to make decisions, or government and local authorities are using to make decisions about local lockdowns? Um, and I should say that I don't think it should be data driven based on cases. I'm sure that there's there's lots of other information that is used to make those decisions at the local level. And to give an example of why that's important, have a look at Northampton, where in mid August, there's this huge spike. And the reason for that huge spike is lots of testing at green core factories where they had a big outbreak. Um, and uh, if you were doing a kind of purely data driven approach, then you would have locked down Northampton entirely at that point. But actually, it was a very localised um, thing that they, that they addressed through local action at that level. So I think we have to be careful about being completely data driven, recognise that this is one set of, of information that leads into that, uh, into those decisions being made. But on the other hand, it would be it would help to understand what the other factors are that is going into making decisions about um, lockdown at the local level. Um, so those are all the points that I that I thought might be useful. The um, the uh, analysis itself is at that um, GitHub.io uh, URL, and the um, the code for it is all at uh, is all on GitHub as well. If anybody wants to pick it up, figure. Uh, play around with it, improve it because like I say, it's my first R. Thank you.